Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so some of you might, if you are here last year, might remember me telling you about how I'm uh, somewhat obsessed with uh, phylogenies. I'm a bit of a fanatic for phylogenetics. And uh, this hasn't changed a year on, uh, but what has changed is we have some new data, and I'm going to uh, talk to you about it today. Uh, but again, first up, I want to uh, reiterate why I think uh, a phylogeny is important. And it really, it gives us, it's important for all these different things, um, but it really, it gives us a window into the past. And uh, in terms of how biodiversity is um, distributed around the planet, I think it gives us a really good um, uh, a way to explore uh, the origins and how biodiversity is maintained. Um, but really, how clear is that window into the past in term, uh, for, for coral reefs, and uh, in particular uh, for fishes that live on reefs and uh, for the corals that uh, provide the structure? And so first of all, I'm going to stick with fishes because uh, they're my favorites. And uh, I was recently involved in a large study, and I, I, this, I love this. I was able to look at one of the biggest trees ever for fish, and this is the largest phylogenetic tree you can currently make with, uh, with data uh, for fishes. And it basically spans um, every, every order of fishes um, in Actinopterygii, uh, which is the raffin fishes. And basically it's built with um, about 37% of uh, molecular data for, uh, for species. Um, so that's 37% 30, of all fishes had at least some DNA um, in GenBank, and we supplemented with new data. And then based on the, the taxonomy, uh, we were able to add every missing species back into the tree. And this, um, uh, so sorry, for the, for the molecular data, about 44% of all reef-associated uh, fishes had at least some molecular data in there. And by adding, in, by adding back in all of the, the species that weren't sampled, we were able to get uh, more accurate estimates of diversification and species and speciation rates. And so uh, we recently published this, um, this large phylogenetic tree and looking at how diversification changes across these lineages. And in particular, we looked at, a, um, at the latitudinal diversity gradient across the globe. And so what we found was somewhat, um, was, was, was really interesting. While we have this um, a pattern of um, a higher diversity and at, the, um, at, at the equator and, and at the lower latitudes, um, when we look at speciation rates, and so this tree um, outlines basically uh, tip, level diver uh, tip level speciation rates across uh, all marine fishes. And what we found was uh, that when you look at um, fishes that are found in lower latitudes and look at their diversification rates, or sorry, speciation rates, uh, they're actually significantly lower than the lineages that you find at the poles. So it's actually the polar regions that have these very, very fast, um, rapid speciation um, rates. And uh, it's interesting that uh, when you look at um, uh, wrasses, um, damselfishes, and gobies, so they're circled in blue there, they account for uh, 3,000 species, um, most, most of which are, are found in coral reefs. Uh, and they, they have a, a, an average speciation rate of about 0.1 lineages per million years. But when you look at um, some of the other lineages found in polar regions, such as uh, you have snailfishes, uh, ice fishes, and um, Rockfishes, they actually um, uh, speciate about three times faster than uh, the things you find at lower latitudes. And so this, I think, is really important. And it's it's just it's it's something that we can get by looking at these large phylogenetic trees. And um, this kind of illustrates it quite nicely. Where uh, this um, where is it? This is the the pattern you expect here. Um, of the, the hump shape um, species, um, species richness across latitude, and this reflects the, the pattern up here. Um, but when you look at uh, speciation rates, you actually see this um, dramatic inverse pattern of what you would expect. And we're still not really quite sure what's driving this pattern, um, but it seems to be quite consistent no matter how we look at this data and how we estimate it. And something I found really interesting is when you look at just single range endemics, so things that are um, restricted to, to just one um, ecoregion, you find the pattern uh, still there. So even though if you compare, say, the, the coral triangle and uh, the, um, the water, the southern oceans around Antarctica, there's a 62-fold difference in uh, the number of species that you find in the coral triangle. Yeah, the polar regions are actually diversifying about three times as fast. So that's really interesting, and it kind of speaks a lot to, well, we still don't understand what's driving high diversity in, uh, in lower latitudes and on coral reefs. And uh, to, to try and answer that, I'm actually 
trying to build new phylogenetic data sets for uh, both, uh, both fishes and corals. And so last year I put up this, um, this figure and basically it outlines how much of the evolutionary history for wrasses on the, on the right there and on a cropper on the left there, um, how much of the evolutionary history we actually know about. And so um, you're looking at about, for, depending on the group, between 50 and 40% uh, of what we know about these two um, big contributors to biodiversity uh, on reefs. Um, and so today I'm going to um, basically talk about a cropper more than, uh, more than the wrasses. But uh, just quickly to show with traditional markers, this is where we are in terms of how much data there's actually available and that's been used in phylogenetic studies and um, that's, that's been submitted to GenBank in the last 18 years. And what's interesting is when you look at Labrids, um, we're actually, um, we're halfway there, as Bon Jovi says. Um, and what's interesting is you have, um, so each line represents a different uh, molecular marker that's used in these phylogenetic trees. And what's interesting is that um, we're at a phylogenetic sampling of, uh, of recent trees of about 380 species. And uh, this, this is quite good that, you know, the, we're combining these, uh, these genetic markers to have quite high enough um, phylogenetic sampling. But when you look at a, a cro the family of cropper day, uh, you see this phylogenetic sampling line is below uh, the highest uh, sampling for, for one of these genes. And what that really, that's because a lot of the stuff that you find in GenBank for um, a cropper day and, and a cropper species is, that, is actually labeled as that. It's a cropper spur. And you don't actually know what it is. Uh, and actually the, the data that actually doesn't overlap with a lot of these genes. So you actually have trouble like creating these alignments um, with uh, a high enough um, um, completeness in these matrices that it's actually difficult to get a clear picture of what the phylogenetic tree looks like. And so luckily when I was designing my DECRA, uh, I um, got in touch with um, Kathy McFadden and uh, Andrea Quattrini, and they recently published a study where they used this method called ultra-conserved elements, uh, which are highly conserved regions uh, across organism gene genomes, and they, they're shared across very distant um, evolutionary lineages. And uh, you're able to target these highly conserved areas and the flanking regions, and they're really useful for looking at phylogenetic relationships. And so this is their paper here where they're looking at across the entire anthrozoa clade. And the outcome of this was that um, basically um, there was not a high coverage when you look at uh, cropper species for the number of UCEs. They also targeted exon regions as well. So uh, you can see that 720 uh, UCE loci and just over 1,000 exon loci. And um, basically the outcome of this paper was we needed to redesign the hexacoral data set or the hexacoral bait set to use. And uh, so that's where we're I got involved and um, we're now using this new hexacoral bait set to actually look at um, amplifying these uh, UCE and exon regions in uh, the family of Cropperdae. So again, this is the, uh, the tree I showed at the beginning. And again, this is basically my progress report where this is the entire Cropperdae family and you can see the, the genera outlined there. So basically in white, you have the lineages that, are, um, that, are, that were previously sampled in phylogenetic studies and have data on GenBank. And the, the other the kind of red lineages there are things that were imputed and added onto the tree based on best guess and, and morphological data. And so, we, um, for each, you can see that we're actually um, uh, getting quite close. Um, we have, um, we sent off a, a set of UCEs last year and we're getting ready to send off another set now. And um, so in 2017, with 100 samples representing about 65 species. And um, uh, when I go back uh, next week, I'm sending off the next 200. And again, we include a cropper day and also some outgroups, so agaricidae and uh, fungids. And so this is just a table outlining how successful this method was in generating um, uh, genomic level data for these, um, for these species. And so this, um, if I just uh, get you look at here, that when we look at a cropper day at the family level, um, for the species that we have sampled, for the samples that we have, um, we got very high coverage um, of these UCE and exon regions. So we're, we're, instead of having just a handful of genes, we now have over a thousand um, independent loci that we can now draw upon to look at these evolutionary relationships. And also when you look down at the, just within a species, so we've got a couple of um, uh, cropper will in the eye uh, samples there, um, you're still getting quite high variation. So that's, um, you've got about 27,000 um, 
uh, parsimoniously informative sites. It's about represents about 1.5 percent of variation within those um, those sequences, and so this is really giving us uh, some new data to to look at the evolutionary relationships within the cropper day. And so this is uh, the first tree, and I've calibrated this to t to uh, absolute time just uh, using a a very um, quick calibration method using some fossils from the literature. But basically, and I've been asked to, to stress by the coral taxonomists that I um, collaborate with, that these, are, these IDs are still, a lot of them are still preliminary. We st we, they know uh, IDs on a lot of them, but we still uh, need to look at the, compare them to the holotypes for a lot of these specimens to be sure that we're looking at what, what we're calling a species is actually what has been previously described. And so there are a lot of things in here, um, but basically we're getting this coverage, which is unbelievable. We have, when we uh, cut down our, our genetic data to a 95% complete matrix, and that is, if you imagine every column is a species, every uh, row is a species, and every column is an independent loci, so all of those um, uh, cell entries, there's at least 95% of those are complete. We're getting... Um, Nearly, a th nearly 900 loci and about a million base pairs. And if we just want a 75% complete matrix, we're getting over, we're getting 2.2 million base pairs. Um, so again, this is probably the most data that's been, um, been uh, generated for uh, phylogenetic purposes for this family. And so again, you can look at the coverage across all these, all our samples. We're getting uh, quite even coverage. There's one or two samples that are still have low coverage in these, um, uh, in these uh, capture methods, but um, we're getting pretty even, um, about a thousand UCEs and a thousand exons. Um, uh, but again, when you're trimming down that data, uh, you're getting the most complete matrix as, as possible. And so what, what are we able to glean from the, this preliminary data set? Well, it actually does a great job of uh, recovering the generic level data. And um, so you can see a, uh, isopora is distinct from acropora, and you, you have an acropora is nested within uh, montipora. So these are things that have been shown previously. Um, but we're also getting um, very high um, support for these um, species level relationships. And some of them are monophyletic and others aren't. Um, but um, for the first time, we're actually getting these, um, this, this structure down to the species level, and we can even get down to population level as well. And so just concentrating on a, a, a cropper genus, uh, there's a couple of um, samples here that uh, are closely related, and we even have um, samples that were uh, collected by, by different people and identified by different people, and it's nice to see that they're actually coming out as within the same clade, so it, it looks like that at least some of the characters that have been traditionally used to, uh, to look at, um, spe uh, to characterize species are working, but it seems like they don't really tell us much about, um, about evolutionary relationships. And so um, the tree here now has been, been colored by the uh, traditionally, um, traditional uh, morphological groups that have been used to um, characterize um, the, uh, the cropper phylogeny. And uh, this here is a, um, it's a, um, a principal component analysis of about um, 30 different morphometric characters. And at the moment, this is um, what the phylogenetic relationships of the, the species that we have sampled in there. Uh, but um, on the next slide, you'll see how distantly, when you look at these morphological variables, um, there's a lot of variation within, spe within species to the, to the extent that it's not really reflecting um, their, how evolutionarily close they are. And so you can see that really like there's a lot of variation in some of the characters that are traditionally used to look at these species. So we really need to be careful about um, in what characters are actually inform uh, species level uh, barriers, but also um, what's informative when um, uh, looking at evolutionary relationships. And so um, on, the, on the elaborate side of things, um, we're still analyzing the data, but we're hoping uh, we're using an acanthomorph bait set. So this is um, uh, this has been this has been used previously to um, capture um, 11, 1100 loci, and it's been really helpful looking at deep lineages. But as yet, it's not been used at the family level. So we're hoping that we'll be able to um, by the end of the year at least have over 55% of the, the laboratory sampled. And again, the end goal of this project is to get complete uh, phylogenetic sampling for, a lot, for these groups and to be able to look at um, patterns of diversification, be able to look at systematics for the groups as well. Um, 
And so just to, um, to wrap up, uh, so the phylogenomic future for coral reefs, well, in terms of the, the coral data, we're uh, of the about 280 sample, uh, 280 species that are, um, that are classified, uh, about 40% of them are only sampling with traditional markers in GenBank. Um, the UCE bait set that we've, uh, we've used here, uh, you're able to get, uh, on average, um, 1,800 loci uh, captured for each sample, uh, and resulting in, at, at um, being conservative, you can, we have um, over a million base pairs for 65 species at the moment. And uh, it is uh, useful for looking at generic level relationships, um, but the traditional acropora and morpho groups um, don't appear to be monophyletic. Um, uh, hopefully by the end of 2018, we'll have a data set for about 140 species. So again, that's half of um, the named species in a cropper day. Uh, for the, the fish for family Labradae, this is a quite a large group of 630 species. Again, 60% of them were sampled in GenBank with traditional methods. But again, these um, alignments don't have uh, a lot of, they have high, high overlap uh, for some groups, but not all of them. Um, by the end of 2018, I'm hoping that the, the UCE uh, data set will be for about 355 species and for 1,100 loci. And with that, I just want to thank my collaborators, um, my research assistants and students in the lab, and uh, just the centre staff as well, and um, the centre for, for funding, and uh, the ARC for, um, for DECRA funding, and all of my collaborating institutions. Thank you very much. <laughs>